Hello everybody and welcome to this month's Google Hangout. Today we have some really interesting guests for you and they're joining us from all over the world. First we have Amy who's back in my office. Hi Amy, she's our tech support. Hi Amy. Hi Vina. Hi. Then we have Jaha Dukare, who is the founder and executive director of Safe Hands for Girls. She is joining us from the Gambia. Hi Jaha. Hi. <laughs> Good to have you with us. And then we have Erin McCann, who is the CEO of Safe Hands for Girls, and she is joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, Erin. Hi, everyone. Well, Jaha, this is an absolute treat for us to have you here. And uh, let us hear about uh, Safe Hands for Girls. So take it away. Um, thank you so much, Veena. Um, I started Safe Hands for Girls in 2013. And um, I am someone that went through female genital mutilation myself when I was one week old. And then I was forced to get married at the age of 15 and then again at the age of 17. And to me, the only way it's possible for us to end FGM is if women like me put a voice to the issue and if women like me put a face to the issue. So that's what led me to start the organization. And ever since starting the organization, we've pushed for laws in the United States. We pushed for the law that made it illegal to transport girls out of the United States for the purpose of FGM. And in 2014, I decided to move back home to the Gambia and started the first youth-led movement against the practice of FGM. A lot of our programs in the Gambia have focused on uh, targeting young people to change their minds. We've pushed for laws in the Gambia as well. In November of 2015, one of our initiatives led to the Gambia banning FGM, which eventually led to parliament criminalizing FGM and then child marriage as well. So a lot of our work in the Gambia focuses on working with school children, um, working with young people, working with religious leaders, trying to change mindset, and uh, working with even the circumstances in the communities. I'm currently in our office in the Gambia, and I'm just going to walk around a bit to show you what um, some of our activities look like, so that way you can have an idea of the work in the Gambia, since that's the primary focus of what Dining for Women is funding. I have my laptop, so, and the internet in the Gambia might be a bit sketchy, but a lot of um, what we do is working with school children. And we have some of the students coming into our office to do indoor trainings, because we like to save costs a lot. And we have posters like the one I'm about to show you, which says um, FGM is fill the blanks. We do a lot of activities with the students. They do their drawings and they fill the blanks so that they get an understanding of what FGM is. And if you look behind me, you will see some of the desks in our office, as well as where, this is where our interns normally sit when they come to the office. And then a lot of the posters that we have posted across the office include posters like this that says, um, what does FGM mean to you? So the students get to define what practices such as FGM mean to them, what it does to the body. And then it gives us an opportunity, as soon as you come into the office, it gives us an opportunity for us to also introduce what safe hands is. Like for instance, we talk to the girls about who safe hands is, what do we do, where and who do we work with, what are our core values, who's the founder of Safe Hands to Girls. Because I'm not always here, so there's times when I'm here to join the trainings with the girls, but there are other opportunities where I'm in the US. And Safe Hands for Girls has somewhat turned into a global movement. We're not only in the Gambia and the, and the US, but we're currently working in five additional African countries as well. And as you can see behind me is um, one of our program officers, Chebby, who is in charge of our girls' mentorship program. And um, so she's behind all the work that we do with young girls in the Gambia. But um, Save Hands for Girls is a survival-led organization that believes that survivors have a role in ending FGM. We don't only see ourselves as victims. We think that it's very, very important that women like us are leading the change. Because for years, when it comes to issues such as female genital mutilation, it's been handled by outsiders of our communities. And having people like us doing this work brings a new meaning to it. And I think that's why our work is so innovative. That's why our work is so crucial. And that's why more people need to be aware of the work that we are doing. And it's not only about us. There's a lot of jihads out there in Africa. We are using our platform and our work to make sure that those people
can do the same things in our communities. Um, before I start talking, I just wanted to introduce our country coordinator in the Gambia that manages our Gambia office, and he'll say something briefly. Say, say hello to everyone. Hi, everyone. I am Say. Uh, I'm here with the boss guy. Yes. <laughs> yes. So pretty much, I think um, I'll start talking about the hands, and I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Jaha. Um, I wanted to ask you something about the fact that you are focusing on the young people in the Gambia on, on this project. Uh, what is your take on dealing with the adults in the Gambia who in some ways are, you know, maybe the keepers of the practice? Those that are involved in this campaign, we've already been through FGM, so we can't really do anything about us. But as future parents, we can make sure that our children don't go through this practice. We do a lot of trainings for religious leaders. We do a lot of trainings for frontline professionals. Like in the Gambia, for instance, recently we trained magistrates and police officers. And we do a lot of work with women kafos, which is like the women groups in every village. And we provide them with radio listening groups. We have partnerships with all the community radios in the Gambia. So our work is not only limited to young people. We understand the importance of that intergenerational dialogue, and we promote that through our work. But when we say that we focus on young people, we believe that that's where change is going to come from. Okay. Um, we know that the, your story has been passionately captured in the film Jaha's Promise, and that is a really long featured um, film that has won one award, or have you won several more? Well, we won the Audience Award in Dublin. And we are hoping that now that the film is going through film festival, we'll be winning a lot more awards in the coming months. Okay. Uh, I think we will keep our members informed whenever that featured film is available for them to watch. But meanwhile, I believe there are several trailers online that they can watch. And we are all looking forward to it and um, very excited about it and excited for you. Uh, Jaha, what do you think would be some of the challenges you think uh, you might face? I mean, how are you going to assess over time, whether your message is resonating with the people in the Gambia? I mean, so far, our work has primarily focused in the Gambia. But for the first time since I've started doing this work, I see that mindsets are changing. I see that people are changing, not because we have laws criminalizing it, but because people want the change for themselves. I mean, we're not a research institution, so we can't give you data. But we know that if data is done, it will show that people's mindsets are changing in the Gambia. I mean, of course, we have people on our team that do research, but the extensive research that we are looking for that shows that the prevalence of FGM has gone down, we believe that that's coming. I mean, all, over the um, next coming years, we will partner with organizations like the Population Council, who we are already partnering with, and are about to launch a big project in the Gambia that would help us not only design programs, but come up with results that are backed by evidence. And I think over time, that's what's going to help us. Some of the challenges that we are going to continue to face in this country is the fact that people connect FGM with religion. That's a huge problem that we have, but we have ways of addressing that because we have powerful religious leaders that are helping us on the campaign trail. Every time we go to villages, every time we go elsewhere, people are helping us. Okay. So, so Jaha, why don't you expand a little bit more about the issue being a cultural practice versus being a religious practice? Yes, so I think a lot of people confuse the fact that FGM is not a religious obligation. FGM is entirely a cultural practice. It has been around before any of the Abrahamic religions. And a lot of people don't know that, even in communities where FGM is practiced. And I think that's why, for us, one of our focus is making sure that we break that religious myth. Okay. Now, earlier when we were chatting, you mentioned about you expanding your projects to some other countries. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? It's possible that people watching this Google Hangout may be interested in connecting with your organization. Absolutely. I think I'll let Erin talk about that. She's the okay. new COO of Safe Hands for Girls, and she'll give the details of what our projects are going to be in the other countries and what our expansion looks like as an organization. Okay. Erin? Go for it. Yeah, definitely. I'm more than happy to talk about this. This is our big sister movement. Um, we have uh, women just like Jaha, other Jahas, um, 
that are doing this work across uh, five countries. So we're obviously in the Gambia, we're in Sierra Leone, uh, we have women in Kenya, in Somalia, in Nigeria, um, and they're all doing this work where they are engaging youth, um, they're empowering girls and educating girls, they're preparing youth as next generation's parents, they're having conversations in the community and with women, um, they're having conversations with um, religious leaders and community leaders in order for some of these countries, they have seen a ban and some have not, but they've been working to bring about an end um, to FGM and early childhood marriage. Now, we're all coming together because there has been a, uh, we've recognized um, that we're all stronger together. These are all women that are survivors that are so strong and are do doing this at the grassroots level. It is empowered completely by them. And what we realized is we're a lot stronger together. So. Uh, we're coming together in the big sister movement. We had a, a retreat where everyone decided all the big sisters came together and decided to move forward and uh, We'll be finishing up the long-term strategy planning uh, by the end of the year and moving forward where we have a very uh, Our vision obviously is to end FGM and early childhood marriage But we have a great audacious goal that we're very excited about to get a ban by the African Union by the AU by 2020 uh, to publicly ban FGM and early childhood marriage. And all these big sisters will be working to protect their little sisters and will also be working to expand beyond the five countries we're in to make sure we put pressure um, on the leaders through um, youth and community engaging in, in activities such as social media, being really smart about the, the advocacy work that we're doing, having those conversations where this is a true grassroots led movement that is we're planning to uh, put pressure on the AU to get the ban and then and then the real work happens where then we work to implement that ban across across Africa. Okay. So I guess having the ban instituted by the AU would be a major, major achievement. But e either of you can answer this. What is the obligation of individual countries to actually even listen to it or even follow it? So, so the AU is like the African black, that's like just the United States of America. So if every country in the AU agrees to ban FGM, individual countries will now be held responsible through accountability. And I think that's where civil society comes in. Even in the Gambia, for instance, if our government does not prosecute cases of FGM, we as civil society can take them to court. So if the AU, every country within the African Union bans FGM, they have a right to protect their citizens. And if they don't do that, as civil society, we can take it to the next level. And that's what we plan to do. Okay. So do both of you believe and agree and Erin, you can expand on this, is that having the law matters because then you have enforcement capability and then you work on civil society and the cultural issues. So legal issues need to precede civil cultural issues. Well, yeah. And, and Absolutely. Really, I think, go ahead, Jaha. Erin, yeah. no, 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 you can go with that. <laughs> we've, been talk, John, we've been talking about this and I get so excited about it. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. But, here, but here's the best part about this. It's almost like you have permission, right? Once once we have this ban, you have that permission. But but here's the deal. In order to get that ban, it's all about organizing gra at the grassroots level of the community. And we have this really amazing tool called Jaha, <laughs> who has a documentary that we plan to have <laughs> that that we plan to have um and to show as many places as possible to engage and find the next big sisters that are going to leave this movement and so we're organizing that group grassroots at that level to where that rises up that 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 puts pressure on those leaders who then make the decision so we're already building that grassroots movement in order to get the ban and then we have legal precedent on our side to work to implement that ban so this is how you build the movement and um you know they've they've got it figured out uh uh, but um, I'm, I'm just happy to be a part of it, but we get so excited talking about it. But yeah, I, it, it absolutely that the legal precedent will help. But in the process of getting that ban, they're building the grassroots out already, country by country and, and community by community. Okay. Jaha, any last thoughts as we wind up? Um, I just want to say thank you to the whole Dining for Women team as well as young members. Supporting a project like this has a lot of meaning and we are ending FGM. It's not something that's just a thought, it's happening. It's possible, and with your support, you're going to advance that even further. So thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Well, <laughs> thank you everybody for joining us in this Google Hangout. Uh, yes, we've had some internet difficulties and technical difficulties uh, across this recording, but I think your passion comes through clearly. And so um, our very, very best wishes to Safe Hands for Girls for absolute success on this project and for many more to come. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Veena.